Ladies and gentlemen, honored guests, Inamori Ethics Prize recipient, Dr. Francis Collins, welcome to the 2008 Inamori Ethics Prize ceremony. I'm Dr. Greg Eastwood. I am the director of the Inamori International Center for Ethics and Excellence here at Case Western Reserve University. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce the president of this university, Barbara Snyder. Welcome and thank you for attending the inaugural Inamori Ethics Prize Ceremony. I'm pleased to welcome you to uh, the in inaugural Inamori Ethics Prize Award Ceremony to honor Dr. Francis Collins. Before we begin, I would like to recognize several distinguished members of the audience. First, of course, Dr. Kazuo Inamori, President of the Inamori Foundation. Dr. Inamori. <laughs> And then we have a delegation from the Inamori Foundation, Dr. Shinji Fukukawa. <laughs> Dr. Fukukawa is Vice President of the Inamori Foundation and former Vice Minister in the Ministry of International Trade and Industry. Dr. Heisuke Hiranaka. Dr. Hiranaka is director of the Inamori Foundation and professor emeritus of Kyoto University. Mr. Toyomi Inamori, senior, senior managing director of the Inamori Foundation. <laughs> Mr. Kazumasa Umemura, he's the executive officer of Kyocera Corporation. <laughs> Mr. Mikio Okuno, Senior Advisor for the International Department at the Inamori Foundation. <laughs> Mr. Takanori Kutsuna, Secretary General of the Inamori Foundation. <laughs> Mr. Kiyohiko Kagoshi, Director, Manager, International Department, Inamori Foundation. And of course, Dr. Francis Collins, recipient of the Inamori Ethics Prize, and his wife, Diane Baker. <laughs> the chair of the Board of Trustees of Case Western Reserve University, Mr. Franklin Salata, and his wife, Jocelyn. and the chair-elect of the Board of Trustees of Case Western Reserve University, Mr. Bud Koch and his wife, Katie. <laughs> Thank you all for joining us for this very special occasion. In addition to welcoming our guests, I would like to extend thanks to the numerous sponsors who have made this evening possible. You can review the full list of sponsors in your program. After our announcement that Dr. Collins was selected as the first Inamori Ethics Prize awardee, we received numerous proclamations and greetings from elected officials, including Governor Strickland, Mayor Frank Jackson, one from former Congresswoman Stephanie Tubbs Jones before her untimely death two, two weeks ago. The proclamations are on display tonight out in the Smith lobby, and I invite you to review them at your leisure. I can't share all of the wishes extended to Dr. Collins, but I would like to read the message sent from President George W. Bush. Dear Dr. Collins, congratulations on being recognized by the Inamori International Center for Ethics and Excellence with the 2008 Inamori Ethics Prize. Our nation is making groundbreaking progress toward new cures for diseases, and we will continue to lead the world in medical research that is ambitious, aggressive, and ethical. Your vision and integrity as a geneticist offers hope to millions of people around the globe and demonstrates the compassionate character of America. I appreciate your dedicated service and many accomplishments while director of the Human Genome Project. Your commitment to continue serving a cause greater than self is exemplary. Laura and I extend our best wishes on this special occasion. Sincerely, George W. Bush. Thank you. 
here it is. Thank you again for being with us this evening. Now I'd like to tell you something about the Inamori International Center for Ethics and Excellence. For those of you who were in attendance at the lecture this afternoon, this might seem redundant. I don't apologize for it. In an educational institution, redundancy is the soul of pedagogy. Think about that. <laughs> <laughs> the purpose of the Inamori Center is to foster ethical leadership around the world. Thus, although the center has a global purview, we believe that the world begins right here in this room, in this building, on this campus, in this city. We engage in research and scholarship, and we sponsor symposia, lectures, and other means of ethical discourse. We are creating internationally recognized programs devoted to ethical leadership and the development of future leaders who, in the words of Dr. Inamori, will serve humankind through ethical deeds rather than actions based on self-interest and selfish desires. The Inamori International Center for Ethics and Excellence began operations over two years ago as the result of a generous gift from Kazuo Inamori, president of the Inamori Foundation of Kyoto, Japan, and founder of the Kyocera Corporation and KDDI Corporation. Dr. Inamori believes that people have no higher calling than to serve the greater good of humankind and society. Case Western Reserve has had a long, uh, has a long productive relationship with Dr. Inamori and the Kyocera Corporation, and it all began with a remarkable person, one of our most distinguished faculty members in the School of Engineering, Dr. Arthur Hoyer. In 1985, Dr. Hoyer became the Kyocera Professor of Ceramics, one of only three such professorships in the country. Professor Hoyer also is a member of the National Academy of Engineering, a very prestigious appointment. Since the 1980s, Dr. Inamori has visited our campus several times. In 1995, he gave the T. Keith Glennon Lecture titled, My Leadership Paradigm, the text of which has helped guide me as I have led the Inamori Center. We think that Dr. Inamori saw at Case Western Reserve University a respect for ethics as a value which lies behind the programs of the various schools, and that a center which fosters ethics, leadership, and internationalization would, would improve on the strengths that, he, that already exist here. The mutual interests of Dr. Inamori and this university in developing such a center culminated in an agreement to create the Inamori International Center for Ethics and Excellence. Here we see Professor Hoyer and Dr. Inamori enjoying the moment as uh, at the time of the signing of the agreement to create the Inamori Center. In May 2006, Dr. Inamori attended the university commencement and was granted an honorary degree, Doctor of Engineering by Case Western Reserve University. And on May 7, 2007, the Inamori Center was dedicated. Here are President Barbara Snyder, Board of Trustees Chair Franklin Salata, Dr. Amori, and me cutting the ribbon. One of the ways in which the center fulfills its purpose of fostering ethical leadership is by awarding a high profile ethics prize. And that is why we are convened for these events today. <clears throat> the Inamori Ethics Prize honors an outstanding international leader who has demonstrated exemplary ethical leadership and whose actions and influence have created something that will improve the condition of humankind. Now, in keeping with Dr. Inamori's approach to life, in which he balances an appreciation of the importance of science and technology with the importance of reflecting on the beauty around us, I would like to introduce the Case Cello Ensemble. You've already heard them. Uh, the ensemble is composed of cellos from the university's Department of Music. The ensemble is directed by Ida K. Mercer, professor of cello for the Department of Music and founder and program director for the Cleveland Cello Society. As your pro program indicates, they will be performing Johann Sebastian Bach's Air from Orchestral Suite in C major.
the best seat in the house. <laughs> Hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. I love cello music. I think it gets into my DNA. <laughs> I hope it doesn't cause any bad mutations. <laughs> now I'd like to tell you something about our Inamori Ethics Prize recipient. Francis S. Collins has led the Human Genome Project for 15 years. During that time, Dr. Collins has paid particular attention to ethical issues related to the Human Genome Project. Also, the Human Genome Project holds enormous potential for the improvement of humankind. Thus, Dr. Collins fits perfectly the criteria for the Inamori Ethics Prize. Of course, Francis Collins has not always been a physician scientist. Here we see him at age two in 1952, about to respond to a reporter who asked, do you think that Watson and Crick have a chance to win the race to determine the structure of DNA? Francis is reported to have said something like, yes. And sure enough, Watson and Crick did announce the structure of DNA the following year, 1953. Francis Collins was raised on a farm near Stanton, Virginia, the youngest of four boys. Listen to what he says about that in his book, The Language of God. I was raised on a dirt farm in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia. The farm had no running water and few other physical amenities. Yet these things were more than compensated for by the stimulating mix of experiences and opportunities that were available to me in the remarkable culture of ideas created by my parents. He dedicates the book to his parents, who he says taught me to love learning. Here we see Francis, age six, contemplating his next stimulating experience. Looking back, Dr. Collins says, I was born into this happy mix of pastoral beauty, hard farm work, summer theater, and music, and thrived on it. At first, he was homeschooled by his mother, whom he regarded as a remarkably talented teacher. He says, learning was, some, was never something you did because you had to. It was something you did because you loved it. At age 10, Francis moved into town and entered public schools. He says, at 14, my eyes were opened to the wonderfully exciting and powerful methods of science. Inspired by a charismatic chemistry teacher, I discovered for the first time the intense satisfaction of the ordered nature of the universe. The fact that all matter was constructed of atoms and molecules that followed mathematical principles was an unexpected revelation, and the ability to use the tools of science to discover new things about nature struck me at once as something of which I wanted to be a part. Here's Francis, age 16, in his senior photo at Robert E. Lee High School, Stanton, Virginia. He seems to be gazing beyond the photographer, maybe to tonight, who knows? <laughs> oh. But Francis Collins is multi-talented and adept at working into his life many interests, intellectual and otherwise. Here we see him playing his guitar, in a role in his mother's play, The Lady and the Unicorn. In 1966, Francis entered the University of Virginia, where he not only played in a band, but he also earned his Bachelor of Science degree in chemistry. From there, he went to Yale University and earned a master's and doctorate in physical chemistry. Next, he entered the University of North Carolina School of Medicine and emerged with his MD. After that, he engaged in several years of training as a resident in medicine followed by a fellowship in human genetics and pediatrics back at Yale University. After all that preparation, Dr. Collins arrived at the University of Michigan in 1984, where he rose to become professor of internal medicine and human genetics. Here we see him in 1990, running a meeting in his laboratory at the University of Michigan. I bet you thought that was a script for the movie Gattaca behind him on the board, but no, it is, a, it is a script of another sort, and it's a portion of the gene that results in cystic fibrosis, one of several genes that Dr. Collins and his colleagues have discovered. I would add that the dean of our school of medicine, Dr. Pam Davis, Pam, are you? There you are, right in the middle. She uses that information in her research on the genetic treatment of patients with cystic fibrosis. Early in his career, Dr. Collins volunteered as a physician in a missionary hospital in Nigeria. 
That experience influenced him to advocate for applying the results of genomic research to improving the health of people everywhere, not just in developed countries. In 1993, Dr. Collins became the director of what now is known as the National Human Genome Research Institute, and of course, the director of the Human Genome Project. That remarkable international project culminated in April 2003 with the completion of a finished sequence of the human DNA instruction book containing over 20,000 genes. If you attended the lecture, Dr. Collins talked about three billion letters. Well, they make up 20,000 genes, so there's no discrepancy, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> Here he is testifying before Congress in support of the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, which protects people from discrimination by health insurers and employers on the basis of genetic information, and which President Bush signed into law last May. Francis Collins has received hundreds of honors, including a string of honorary degrees, but the honor that has to be special for him is his receipt of the Presidential Medal of Freedom the nation's highest civilian award. Here is President Bush bestowing the Presidential Medal of Freedom on Dr. Collins in the White House last November. The inaugural recipient of the Inamori Ethics Prize is a remarkable, multi-dimensional person, a physician, a scientist, a husband, a father, a musician, and a Harley biker. <laughs> President Snyder, it is my pleasure to present Francis Sellers Collins recipient of the 2008 Inamori Ethics Prize. Ethics Prize honors outstanding international ethical leaders who demonstrate exemplary ethical leadership and whose actions and influence have greatly improved the condition of mankind. Dr. Collins, throughout your long and distinguished career, you have consistently emphasized the importance of ethical and legal issues in genetics, while at the same time working tirelessly to improve the lives of people worldwide. On the recommendation of the Inamori Ethics Prize Selection Committee, it is my pleasure to present to you the inaugural Inamori Ethics Prize Medal. Well, it is indeed uh, an incredible honor uh, to be here this evening uh, receiving this first ever Inamori Ethics Prize, and I would like to acknowledge uh, the leadership in so many fields, and especially in this field of ethics, of Mr. Inamori uh, sitting here in the front row who has made this all possible, this center, this prize, and who I had the pleasure of getting to know just a little bit uh, during the course of today. Uh, this is something I will always uh, cherish and I will always remember uh, today. It has been especially nice because of the chance that I've had to have some of my family members here and some of my former scientific trainees uh, sitting out there seeing your smiling faces decorated in tuxedos, which I never thought I would ever see. <laughs> <coughs> it is uh, really a wonderful memory all the way around. So thank you from the bottom of my heart uh, to everyone who made this possible. There's a wonderful Japanese proverb uh, that I ran across at about the time that we were finishing the sequence of the human genome. It says, if you wish to learn the highest truths, begin with the alphabet. Think about it. Well, I think that's what we've been up to here. 
with the human genome because it is a script and it has an alphabet and we have learned it and it's out there on the internet for all the bright minds of the planet to begin to figure out how to put it to good use and they are very vigorously doing so. And that is the greatest dream that any of us had back in 1990 when this enterprise was just getting underway and many people doubted that it could ever succeed. And yet here we are. And yet it is also the case as we talked about this afternoon that the science is not sufficient to guarantee that the public will benefit. The science can rocket forward and people may in fact not receive those benefits and may even be injured if we don't coordinate that together with a clear understanding of what the ethical, legal, and social consequences of these advances might be. And in that regard, the chance that I've had in these 15 years uh, to work with a remarkable cadre of scholars from bioethics, from social science, uh, from law, from theology, all of whom brought their own particular perspective uh, to this field and have put us now, I think, in a much better position to be able to say, we know what we're doing here. We're prepared for some of those outcomes. We've thought about it. We've tried to put policies in place to make sure that this helps people and doesn't hurt them. It hasn't been without its moments. I must say, when you try to get a geneticist and an ethicist to talk to each other in those first couple of meetings, it doesn't always go so smoothly. We all have our different jargon. We have a different way of thinking about problems. In fact, I'll tell you a very quick story, which is actually not true, but it makes a good story. <laughs> Uh, about an ethicist uh, who was a big thinker and liked to have big thoughts and liked to do big things to sort of see big pictures. And so not only was he an ethicist, he was a hot air balloonist. <laughs> no comment about the hot air part. Now, that wasn't the point of the story, even though you might think so. So uh, the ethicist one beautiful day uh, got his balloon going and floated up into the sky, looked down across the beautiful landscape it's a gentle wind blowing. Uh, it was a cool morning. And he was so caught up in the experience of looking at all this beauty around him that he rather forgot to pay attention about where he was going and how long he had been up there. And after a while, he realized he didn't recognize any of the landmarks, and he wasn't at all sure where he was. And he figured he needed some guidance. And it was now a fairly uh, rural area, but he spotted down below him a farmhouse. And in the backyard of the farmhouse, uh, he saw somebody uh, working in the garden. And so he was now sort of coming down a bit so he could shout from his elevation of 50 or 60 feet down to this person in the yard. And he said, hello down there. The person was a bit surprised to hear this voice coming from the sky, but looked up and saw the balloon. Uh, and so the ethicist called out, uh, excuse me, sir, uh, can you tell me where I am? And the person in the yard looked up and said, well, actually, you're in a hot air balloon about 50 feet above the ground. <laughs> the ethicist was a little irritated about that. He said, excuse me, are you a scientist? <laughs> to which the guy on the ground replied, well, yes, actually, I, I am. How did you know? The ethicist said, well, because you have just given me information that is 100% accurate but absolutely useless. <laughs> The now revealed scientist was not amused by that comment. <laughs> said, excuse me, are you an ethicist? <laughs> the ethicist in the balloon, now being the one taken a bit aback, had to admit that he was. So how did you know that, he asked. Well, said the scientist, you don't know where you are, you don't know where you're going, and you're trying to blame it all on me. <laughs> so you see, we have this problem of speaking to each other. But we've gotten past that. And the scientists and the ethicists have learned to speak each other's language and to appreciate each other's contributions in a way with the Genome Project that hasn't really happened before. And so as I, with great gratitude, accept this prize, I feel I'm really standing in for all of those people who over these years have dedicated their lives and their ideas and their willingness to work as a team to try to make this revolution in genetics a really dramatic one that is going to have benefits and not casualties. I'll finish with a quote that I'm fond of uh, from Thucydides, one of those names you should not say after a glass of wine, but I'm still okay. So <laughs> Thucydides talking about this very kind of circumstance 
and here's a motto, I think, that could very well be adopted uh, by the Inamori uh, Center, wrote the words, the bravest are surely those who have the clearest vision of what is before them, glory and danger alike, and yet notwithstanding, go out to meet it. So may we all go out to meet it with our eyes wide open and do good things for humanity. That's why we're all here. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Dr. Collins, and congratulations once again on this well-deserved honor and fitting recognition of your many contributions to humankind. The moving conclusion of your book, The Language of God, ends with this charge. Let us together seek to reclaim the solid ground of an intellectually and spiritually satisfying synthesis of all great truths. This call to action echoes the mission of the Inamori International Center for Ethics and Excellence, which is to promote global ethical leadership. To take the global view is to celebrate the international diversity of beliefs, both intellectual and spiritual. It is also to recognize the many core values that we all share in common, the human values that transcend culture and are oblivious to borders. There is an ancient Japanese saying, there are many paths up the mountain, but the view of the moon from the top is the same. To be a champion for ethics is to support the view that there are many paths to the truth, but also to believe that there are universal truths to be found. For example, the absolute truth that all human beings deserve to be treated with dignity and respect. We cannot defend human rights anywhere unless we are passionately intolerant of injustice everywhere. To pursue excellence is to try to understand what it means to be human, from the elegant structure of our DNA to the immeasurable courage that can be held within a human heart. It is only by setting excellence as our goal that we can fully commit to the struggle to improve ourselves and grasp our true potential. And to be a leader is to believe that progress is possible and to inspire others to reach beyond themselves to make a difference. It has been said that cynics are disillusioned idealists. Overwhelmed by the problems all around us, some just give up. Great leaders remind us that we can have a positive effect on our world. The fact that we cannot fix everything must never stop us from trying to fix something. If we can soften one person's pain, forge one new friendship, or amend one flawed policy, we can make things better. And little by little, we can encourage the moral evolution of humanity. This is why the Inamori International Center for Ethics and Excellence exists, and what we hope its programs will reflect. And as we go forward from tonight, I invite all of you to join us as we seek out the best ways to embody the ideal of global ethical leadership. Thank you. I think we just glimpsed the future. Shannon, of course, will be taking over from me as the new director of the Inamori Center shortly. I think you will agree that the center is in very good hands and the future is bright. Thank you all for coming to help us celebrate the inaugural awarding of the Inamori Ethics Prize. Please enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you. <laughs>